<laughs> All right. I, I'm really excited. Today, we're talking to Jared Yates Sexton, who wrote a book called The Man They Wanted Me to Be. And I'm going to tell you, Jared, I actually, your book was one of the first that I read. Actually, I listened to it on the audio edition when I, when I started to write Father Figure. And, um, um, you know, so it was before I had done all of, the, all of my research. And, uh, uh, and I just reread it yesterday. And I meant to skim it, but I read the whole thing because it was sort of, uh, um, um, and this time I read it on, in text. <laughs> I didn't listen to it this time. And, uh, and I, I, you know, it was really, it was really a pleasure to, it was a pleasure to really, it's fun to go back and read something like after you've thought of it. And I found out I just. Discussed... Oh, no. I was putting text on paper. I, it had been months since I had read your book. So, uh, I'm excited to talk to you about it. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I, that's always interesting to hear people that listen to the audiobook. They had my voice in their head for hours, which feels very odd for me. Like it creates a, a nice little relationship, I think. So. I, I, I find that when you record the audiobook, tell me if this is your same experience. I, found it, I find it to be the weirdest thing because you're like reading to this one producer and engineer. It's like super intimate. And it is. It is. And it's really weird because it's like when you're writing a book like this, you're talking about personal trauma, experiences, all that stuff. And it's a total stranger on the other side of a wall. And then just out of nowhere, they'll be like, go back on that last line. You missed the, and it's like, oh, okay. Well, I forgot that we're not involved in like just an intimate conversation here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I was lucky on my second one. I got to do it at a friend's studio. So it wasn't a stranger, but the first book I did an audio for, it was a total stranger. And I was like confessing my deepest, darker, darkest <laughs> secrets to them. <laughs> Well, I, I, I want to start with your book because, you know, in, in some ways, your book and my book, the, one of the things that's similar about them is I think we're, we're, we're both really sort of reconciling our understanding of our own fathers and, and, of, the, and of the male role models in our lives. And, and of course, in, in, in that sense, there's a similarity, this sort of sense of having to let go of your own father, having to let go of the images that, that you have of masculinity and fatherhood. Um, you know, one thing that's different that I'd just love to get your thought on is, is where my role models were pretty good. I mean, I mean, while they have their shortcomings and they were certainly inadvertently uh, replicating toxic masculinity in places they didn't mean to be, where you have some really in this memoir, some, some, some really horrible stories of violence and abuse and, and sort of the, the worst the worst iterations you can imagine of toxic masculinity. Yeah, it's it's really weird to think back. Um, every time I hear someone say like father figure, right? Like for me, and, and you always hear that. And it's like, I think it's supposed to like in American popular culture, it's supposed to evoke these like sepia tone memories of like throwing the ball around in the yard. And for me, there are moments of that, like with my grandfather, who was a beautiful role model, a beautiful father figure. But I also, unfortunately, had to undergo a lot of trauma from father figures, so to speak, who um, they were hurting. They were really, really hurting in their own way. And because of masculinity, uh, they lacked the ability to communicate those things. They lacked the ability to really wrap their heads around it and really begin to heal. And as a result, um, you know, as, as is the unfortunate case in a lot of these instances, they, they found their only means of expressing themselves through violence. Whether or not it was physical violence, mental violence, emotional violence, um, they, they lacked the ability to do otherwise. And so unfortunately, me and my mother, we were put in these positions with some really toxic, poisonous, abusive figures. And uh, so I, I was really lucky again to have a positive role model, a positive father figure with my grandfather, who, you know, was this World War II veteran, this decorated veteran who came back from the war. He dealt with his trauma in the way that a lot of, you know, veterans did. He drank a lot, but then eventually he found comfort with himself and was able to be emotional and cry and be supportive and emotionally supportive with the people around him. And so I was really lucky that I had that because I'm not sure who I would have been otherwise. It's really important to look at what those figures necessarily do and what they inspire and how they help people, even people who have been exposed to some really awful stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that really that really struck me was it, it made me think of uh, 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 when I reread your book yesterday, it made me think of, of 
just blind spots I had. There's a line in Father Figure where I say something like, you know, men, men mansplain where they, where they can because in most of their lives they can't. But I, I want to get to what you're talking about, you know, maybe realize that for a lot of people, it's a lot worse than mansplaining. Um, and I, I guess I, I wanted to hear you if you, if you could explain which, what you do so well in the book, which is that, that cycle of shame, right? That loop, that sort of shame loop. Uh, uh, of of where mansplaining or violence or or abuse and and or toxic masculinity in its most innocent inadvertent uh, appearances sort of um, uh, re gets reproduced as men deal with their own sense of shame and inferiority. Yeah, the when you start to look at this thing, and you know, like the immediate reaction to it uh, with a lot of this stuff is like horror and outrage and anger, and rightfully so, right? The immediate reaction to it, which is you know about protecting yourself and protecting the people around you, getting away from these like really awful toxic elements. But when you start to really investigate how this stuff takes place and how it goes, it's it's a um, it's a legacy. It's it's an it's it's an inherited system of abuse. And and what we've come to call that is socialization, right? The way that you're taught that you're supposed to live. And with men, particularly when we're talking about traditional masculinity, uh, we are talking about a system wherein sons have been physically and emotionally abused by their fathers, who have been physically and emotionally abused by their fathers. And it goes from one generation to another. And the, the really horrific part of that systematic inherited abuse is that at some point, like if you haven't seen anything else, right? If you did not have a figure like my grandfather, who was supportive and loving and, and, and all that, you don't know that that isn't a problem. You think that's reality, right? It's like the old, um, you know, it's like the old philosophical idea of like, if you are raised in a cave of darkness, you never know that you're in a cave. You don't know that you are in the darkness. And so a lot of men who are raised in these old traditional masculine roles and, you know, they're, they're being abused either physically or emotionally by their fathers who are passing on the abuse. Um, they get the idea that masculinity is supposed to be about being strong, invincible and stoic, right? Never, ever talking about your feelings. Matter of fact, never feeling feelings, right? Because that's weak. That's a gendered idea. Well, so what ends up happening is that expectation is so ridiculous. And impossible. Nobody lives that way. And in fact, in my research, I don't know if you came across this, you actually find that men are actually more emotional than women. Like they actually truly are like almost on a genetic level. And, and what you end up finding is that they are taught through abuse not to understand that and not to be in a connection with that. So when it happens, the only frame of reference people who have grown up in that and don't know any better is, oh, this is a personal failing. I'm doing something wrong. I'm failing at what's expected out of me. And that's when overcompensation comes in. And when we talk about toxic masculinity, in a lot of ways, one of the things we're talking about is overcompensation, right? So I feel weak. I don't feel like I'm reaching this impossible level of masculinity. So I have to overcompensate. I have to do something to show you that I am capable of that masculinity, right? And in my family and in a lot of families, that comes in the form of bragging, boasting, uh, mansplaining, putting people in their places, insulting them, knocking them down a peg, uh, toxic competition. In my family, it involves like showing off your guns, talking about how strong you are, your romantic pursuits, although it's put a little bit more vulgar than that. Um, you know, and, and what ends up happening, and, and um, I'm sure you all have seen this or, or people watching this have seen it, like people will put on this boisterous performance. And it also goes into the clothes that they wear, the trucks that they drive, the people they vote for, how they live in a society. And when those people leave the room, even though they put on this swaggering performance of overcompensation, more often than not, the people in the room are like, oh, I feel so bad for him. I just, you know, I hope he finds what he needs. I, I, it's just so sad to watch this bragging and, bo you know, boisterous thing. And what we end up finding is that this is a performance that is not just for the outside world, but it's for the individual as well, because they're trying to convince themselves, no, I'm not faulty. Like, I totally reached this level that's totally non-existent. And so what you see is this um, perpetuation of it. And then unfortunately, let's say that they have a kid and they're raising that kid 
And they then start projecting their own insecurities on that kid. And they start punishing the kid for not reaching that fictional point of masculinity. And then the cycle just continues. And, and unfortunately, um, as we've watched over the past couple of years, that's not just a familial thing. That's not just a relationship thing. That's a cultural thing. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And it is like one of the biggest problems that we have is this idea of masculinity and the performance that it, it always puts forth. And it, it, it runs from murders, assaults, domestic abuse, personal assaults to uh, war. I mean, I mean, like it, it really does not stop. It's, it's everywhere and it, it, uh, it penetrates everything. So what's interesting to me is, though, that it is so pervasive and it is so replicated and yet here you are living in the culture that you are. And yes, you had this fantastic role model, but I imagine there are plenty of great role models out there. What happened in your life or what realization did you have that allowed you to break out? I mean, it's really so extraordinary to see what you've done with this. Um, I have to tell you, it was a really long, extensive process, even though, so I grew up in a situation where I was very sensitive and creative. I felt very ostracized from that masculine world. <laughs> and, you know, while it was happening, I always felt like two, twofold on this. One, I felt like this seems wrong. Something about this is wrong. But I then told you it was your doppelganger. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but then the other part of it, and this is in, this is inevitable, the other part of it is a personal shame. It's like, no, they're not the ones that are wrong. There are more of them than there are of me. This must be my own personal thing. So even though I felt outside of it, and even though I was abused by one person after another trying to beat me into a mold, right? Even though I knew it was wrong. And I then went to college and I studied things like feminism and gender studies and, and all of that stuff. Even though I understood it, that programming was still there, right? It's still running under the surface. And one of the things I talk about in the book um, is that you don't really, everyone always asks me, how'd you get out? Well, you don't get out, you know, like the programming is always there and I am only as good as today or tomorrow, right? Like there, there are always moments where it's like, I have to constantly check myself on this stuff and think about it. Like, so for instance, before I even got dressed to do this, like we wear costumes. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, like we're sitting here with beards. I would be wearing a flannel, but it's, you know, 80 out today. <laughs> And, and I'm sitting here in like jeans and boots and all of that. Like I'm, I'm wearing a costume. There's a difference between putting on the costume and thinking, well, it's just what I like because I'm a man and thinking, oh, this is my costume. This is my man costume and constantly like putting into consideration the things. But again, it's not enough. Like I went through years of like self-abuse, destructive behavior, substance abuse. Uh, I, I mean, I, I nearly... I nearly succumbed to this stuff. I nearly died a few times because it was so traumatic and awful and it, it ingratiates itself. So the way that I was able to get through was a combination of people who cared about me, self-reflection, therapy, and the fact that I did have a couple of people in my life who gave me an example or communicated something to me that is now a voice in the back of my head when the other voices start coming in. Hmm. Yeah. Very, very powerful. <laughs> performance there that you've managed to pull off. Oh, it's um, a lot. I mean, it's, it's quite radical. But back to the questions. <laughs> so, so I guess, um, I mean, I think we have a lot in, in common, but I'm also fascinated with the differences. Obviously, I keep asking questions uh, uh, about them. I, I grew up in, a, in, a, in an elite urban family, a, uh, a family that, that was Judaic. Um, um, and, uh, Judaism was really important to, to, to my parents. It's not, you know, it's important to me as an identity marker, but not as a ritual or a, or a religious uh, sensibility. Um, um, and so, you know, you, you write a lot about the sort of um, white American privilege and entitlement, which I, I, I didn't really, you know, I didn't have the same sense of sense of that. There was a lot of gender uh, privilege, a lot of gender entitlement, but certainly, um, certainly a kind of aspiration towards American superiority, not a not not as a given. And, I, and I'm asking that because one of the things you do really, really well that I wish you would do for those who are watching is you tell what I found to be a really fascinating framing of 
the history of either toxic masculinity or marital fragility uh, from the Civil War to, to the Vietnam War. And I wonder if you could just go, just sort of go through that and that link between militarism and masculinity. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll throw down my markers. So I come from a very small, small rural town in Indiana. I come from a dirt poor like one way trash family, I'll just be honest. And you know, like with their laborers, they work uh, in factories, they work in coal mines, they're prison guards, all of this stuff. So I'll go ahead and I'll start with my family's identity now. So like my, my family, and this is really tragic, and I'll be honest, like it gets me emotional now that I'm removed from it, right? My family is the type that the men work themselves to the point that their bodies give out. You know what I mean? Like to the point where they can't get out of bed in the morning, you know, and and like it's not like they're going to put in for like workman's comp or anything because it's a badge of honor. Right. Uh, you're not I've making had three knee surgeries and I'm right. still standing. <laughs> so they're not getting ahead. They're not saving any money. They're drowning in debt. They're not necessarily successful uh, professionally. But I'll tell you what, that's not how they count their worth. They count their worth in, I gave everything that I had. It doesn't matter if I made it or not. I gave everything that I have. And that shows that I tried, right? And they'll say things, and this is really tragic and again, heartbreaking. They will say things, um, you know, they'll, they'll be like, when I die, just throw me in a hole. Don't even worry about a funeral. Just throw me in a hole and don't even worry about me. Don't even have a funeral. Don't even cry over me because they see themselves. They've been taught. They have no utility or worth outside of their labor, right? And there's a reason for this. And if you actually start tracking the history of masculinity, here's what you find. So post-Civil War, we, of course, have an industrialization in the United States of America. Um, you know, the North takes over the economy, and all of a sudden we start moving towards industry. We start moving towards factories and producing these things. Well, guess what? The idea of masculinity changes in a hurry. Suddenly we need men to go into factories and give over their bodies. And this is before the 40 hour work week. This is before the weekend. This is before, you know, you have OSHA coming in telling them not to have chemicals or not to have like these dangerous situations. So you need men to go in, get paid pennies on the dollar and give up their bodies. So what happens over time, going back to the idea that we were talking about of inherited masculinity, you get a man teaching his son, oh, you are going to go into the same factory where I've been working, or you're going to go into the same mine. And that's how you're a man. You give over your body. And it doesn't matter if you ever get ahead, which by the way, the American dream always tells you, well, maybe one day you will. But then we see generations upon generations of the same like grist in the mill. So what ends up happening is going into World War II, we start having disposable men and men who have nothing beyond what they're able to buy. They're going into debt. And at this point in America, we have going into debt for trucks the size of battleships, <laughs> right? Like they cost fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to show how manly they are and all this stuff. Uh, but what we end up seeing is the transfer in generations has changed. The greatest generation, which would be my grandparents, they gave up everything to fight fascism, fight World War II, go through the Great Depression. They didn't expect anything. Right. They, they didn't expect riches. They didn't expect any of that stuff. We then go into uh, the, the boom generation, which was where my parents are. And that's where you start to see a change. And all of a sudden, um, and I talked about this in the book, like my father, my father thought that he needed to go in the tradition to go fight Vietnam. He gets to the point where he's going to go to Vietnam and he's too afraid to do it. Right. He doesn't want to give himself up to. And by the way, that's totally understandable. This is a war that was not World War II, right? So then he leaves and we have an entire generation of men who are now having to start positioning themselves and comparing themselves to that generation that was what we consider selfless, right? That they gave up their bodies and they gave up their own fortunes to do this. And eventually we get to where we are. And we now have a situation where we have generations of men who have now been taught to behave in a way that doesn't exist anymore. Those factories are gone, right? They, NAFTA, free trade, all of that moved away factories. America is now turned into a consumer society and a communication society. And this is one of the lingering things we have to talk about, which is men aren't 
taught to communicate. They're not taught to work with other people. And so they are being, quote unquote, left behind in this economy. They don't know how to go into offices. They don't know how to go in and talk to people. And so they, they lack those resources. So what have they done? They've doubled down on the performance of masculinity. And then, yeah, yeah and, and, and it's, it's absolute madness when you look at it. And then you start realizing that this explains a lot of stuff. Like I was looking out my window earlier and there's this thing going on with these pickup trucks where in the past it used to be, you know, those stickers with like the family. It's like the mom, dad, and the little kids. Now it's their guns, right? Now it's fascistic type iconography. And so what you actually see in cultures like ours throughout history is that when that stuff goes away and when the identity stays, what you end up seeing is that people double down on things like fascism, because fascism is the final harbor for emasculated men who want to feel powerful. And do you think they, ha I mean, I, I'm surprised more don't have some more historic context for how bad fascism is for everyone and why that maybe isn't the best direction. Is that just completely <laughs> missing or is it blocked or? Especially when you consider the grandfathers were all fighting fascism. <laughs> Precisely. Basically. Yeah, but the problem, and, and here's the thing. So like, this goes back to like my grandparents, right? Like my grandparents were strictly World War II generation. My grandpa like is, they had medals, right? Like he got wounded in World War II. Part of his identity was that. My grandmother was one of those Rosie the Riveter types who was in the factories doing this stuff. Well, the problem with American mythology is that we have completely misunderstood fascism. We think that this is something that just popped up in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, and but we took care of it, don't worry about it. What we actually failed to acknowledge is that America has a long history of fascist movements. Uh, there was actually, and to go ahead with our conversation, there was a massive rise in fascism after the Great Depression in America, because you had a lot of young men who didn't have jobs, who were disillusioned about what they could do, and they're they were being emasculated. So all of a sudden, you have things like the American Nazi Party. You have the Silver Shirts. You have like all of these like homegrown fascistic movements in America. And what ends up happening is we don't want to think about that. We don't want to think about the fact that America has these poisonous elements to it. So the story, like we were talking about, becomes very simplified which is, well, fascism was over here. It, we took care of it. Don't worry, it'll never come back again. And uh, fast forward to where we are now. And yeah. And this is, and this is different. <laughs> and this is different, right? It just so happens it's a bunch of emasculated young white men who are getting together in groups, paramilitary groups, to fight each other, carry weapons, overthrow a capital, um, drive big trucks, and carry around weapons and guns. It's the exact same cycle over and over. But the root of it, and this is the scary thing, is at the root of all of this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what masculinity is, right? Because a lot of people are like, well, of course, they're, they're being fascistic. They're men. That's the It's the testosterone, which actually we've misunderstood. Aggressive behavior makes testosterone. It doesn't go the other way around. So it's not actually male nature. It's male fake nature. It's the male detachment from nature that has actually created this entire situation. Yeah, well, but since you, you moved right, it's a, that's a perfect segue. You were really one of the, the, the first journalists to point out uh, how, how much Trump, the, the Trumpism was connected to toxic masculinity. And, and I wonder, I mean, and so that we can start to unpack this a bit, um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that idea about sort of masculine versus feminine politics, right? right? Which are the masculine issues? Which are the, the, the feminine issues? Yeah, there's so much to unpack there. So I'll go ahead and I'll start with this, which goes back to what we were talking about in terms of the overperformance of masculinity. Donald Trump, and I know that we don't want to talk about him, and I know people just want to like just turn yeah, the page. A but, little bit of space now from an intellectual yeah, standpoint, I think we'll it, roll with it. It's it's with it? it's really important, particularly with the conversation of masculinity, because he is the perfect embodiment of American masculinity in this regard. This is a uh, boisterous, bragging, swaggered man, right? But he's very insecure. 
He's if people criticize him, he loses his mind. Right. He also is always worried about how he looks, how he's presenting himself, always talking about how strong he is. But he's actually brittle, soft. The amazing thing here is that American men, particularly of the type that we're talking about, they saw one of their own. He spoke their language. It, it was like, well, you're looking for like a station on a radio dial. Like they zeroed in and they're like, this is our guy, right? And so it ended up being a thing where all of these different levels came together, where Trump suddenly became a symbol, which is while most people were offended by the things that he said or that they thought that they were like morally reprehensible, that actually gave men the opportunity to use it as a metaphor, which is to say, oh, you're offended that he said that? Well, it doesn't offend me. I must be stronger than you, right? Oh, you're triggered? I hope I trigger you. And so what ends up happening is that the male insecurity turns into a troll. It turns into a trollish profile where suddenly it's about dominance. And anybody who's had a uh, toxic father figure or a toxic boss or someone around them, they know this. Like when all of a sudden a discussion will take place and you're talking about politics, right? right. If that conversation comes up and someone starts saying, well, we need to take care of people. And it's like, oh, we need to take care of people, do we? That's ridiculous. You're weak. And that conversation is the exact same one that we've now been having for years. And we've actually found in research and in all of this stuff that men are less likely to support ideas or political concepts if it means showing empathy. And this is an amazing thing, actually, that I, I when I found this in my research, I had to like go for a walk, which is if you and in all these studies on empathy with men, there were incredible findings. If you give men empathy tests and they know it's about empathy, they score so low. They, they're like, I don't care about anybody. I'm so strong. I'm independent. But if you turned it into a competition where you said to men, oh, if you are more empathic, then women, you will win a reward. They suddenly were able to do it. And what these tests determined was that they were performing it. Right. They knew full and well what empathy was, but to give themselves to empathy meant that they would explain that they were weaker than they were presenting themselves. So this goes back to the politics. They're more likely to support wars. They're more likely to support racist positions. They're more, li they're more likely to not support things like global climate change, because, or I mean, climate catastrophe ideas. Because if you say you're scared, well, are, are you a man or are you not? Oh, you're not going to wear a mask? Why? Because the mask is a symbol that you are, quote unquote, afraid. And I would actually say very quickly that I thought this was a missed opportunity. We should have taken the mask situation. Of course, it was bad because Trump was president. We should have taken it from the mask is a thing that says you're afraid to. The mask is something you do to protect people. And I think that that simple little linguistic rhetorical change, I think you would have found some men. And I actually think gun control would be benefited by that as well. Give up your guns, sacrifice your guns to protect your family. And I think that those rhetorical changes would actually make a huge difference. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And, I, and, and listening to what you're saying, I was thinking, I was, I was thinking, you know, from now on, anyone that hears someone complain about political correctness, right? Like when you're right. watching Bill Maher and he complains about political correctness, you just hear him going, going, what are you, a little girl? Because that's really what's at the heart of the heart of that. Like, why should we care about someone else's feelings if we're real men? Yeah. And, and, and actually, if you go to the, the heart of the political correctness debate, it's not just about ethics and morals and communication. It goes back to what we were talking about. It's about the changing of industry. And I have to tell you, the men in my family who worked in factories, coal mines, all of that, if you get a lot of those men together, they compete over who can be the most offensive because you're actually watching men compete over who is the most masculine and who is dominant. Well, when we start talking about political correctness, what we're actually talking about is how to engage in modern economies, right? Because you can't go into an office and say all this stuff because it's important for a communicative industry to build trust and respect. And so you actually have on the American right with this masculine overcompensation, it's a rejection of new economies, new open societies, new shared spaces. And it's saying, no, I still live in this world. 
And I still, and, and it goes back to the weakness thing, right? Oh, if you're going to worry about how other people feel, you are weak and you are letting someone get over you. So it, it is completely antithetical to this old traditional masculinity. And again, what we find is men aren't able to communicate. They just aren't. They choose not to. The socialization renders them incapable of doing it. And so now they have entered into a space where the only thing they have left to do is to rage. And that rage is how these men are able to communicate. That's the only means that they're really able to do it. So it seems like we're in this position now. What are the what's that? thing where you that toy where the the harder you pull on it the tighter it gets <laughs> oh the 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 finger trap yeah the finger trap thank you finger trap yeah articulate you are um you know it, it seems like, like i find it speaking of political correctness i'm thinking chinese hand yeah you, you know no, no, it's finger it trap no but so you know we're, we're we're it's just getting tighter and tighter and angrier and angrier i mean I, so everything you do to try and break it does just the opposite I, what what's the what, where does it, what's the transformation? So that, that that's the $64,000 question. And what I would argue is this, is a lot of the conversations that we are having politically, uh, there it, it's trench warfare, right? It's like, I'm going to dig in here. You're going to dig in here. We understand that we are adversarial, right? And so as a result, we are now going to argue about where things are. The problem is that that framework actually just helps people like Donald Trump. I mean, that's where they thrive, right? Because they're not interested in making anything better. They're actually interested in using that division to empower or profit, right? That's all they're in. They're not interested in moving forward. My argument is this, and, and again, I come from a working class white family from Indiana. And I love them very much, but I've got bad news for some people, which is we are not going to get them to be less sexist or less racist by telling them to be less racist or less sexist. The problems is, the problem are, and this is what intersectionality teaches us, all of these things are included. They're all one big organism. So if you can't, like you were saying about like the finger trap, right? If you can't move this finger, you can't move this finger. Well, what do you do? Well, that's also a two-dimensional problem right? We have to change the dimensions. And going back to what I was saying in terms of uh, FDR and, well, actually I didn't bring up FDR yet, but I'm going to now. If you go back to the Great Depression, what you found was that young white men were becoming radicalized as they couldn't find work, as their material conditions started to fall apart. Well, what we find is if you actually address the material conditions of these young men, they're less radicalized. Right. So you're not going to go march with the alt right if you have to be at work on Monday. You know what I mean? Like then eventually they start looking for these things because the radical groups say, hey, I know you don't feel like a man. Put this put this armband on, throw up this salute and then march on the Capitol. You will see that you are a man. Right. Well, what we found was FDR's New Deal, which, of course, led to the Civilian Conservation Corps and all these infrastructure projects, right? It gave all these people things to do. It made them invested in society. And by the way, they got to look down. They're like, I made that park, right? With my hands and my brawn, I was able to do that. So I think what we actually need to do in this country is, is bring the temperature down a little bit. And I think the way that you do that is you start investing in those projects again. And, and, and the good news there, and, and I keep telling people this, if you want to convince people like my family that global climate change is real and it needs addressed, give them a job addressing global climate change. All of a sudden, their bumper stickers are going to change. You know what I mean? If they start having a job making solar panels and making um, uh, uh, wind turbines, right, and, or doing green energy, all of a sudden they are going to turn those things into markers of masculinity, which is how this whole process goes. The problem was in the 1990s when we started moving towards free trade and deindustrialization, they didn't have anything. They didn't have an answer for it beyond it. They said, oh, we'll train them how to use computers. They didn't want to learn computers because computers were going to be about communicating, right? Computers were going to be about entering this new space. They had these old traditions. So what we need to do is bring the temperature down, start changing these things. And I, I think you'll see a massive change in this country. Hmm. So hmm. you must you must be a fan of uh, your Indiana friend, Mayor Pete. 
<laughs> I I have issues with Mayor Pete here and there, but I have to tell you that one of the things that I really enjoy about Buttigieg is that he has started to change the idea of masculinity in Indiana, right? Like, I mean, here's a guy who is a veteran, right? But he's also openly gay and, you know, progressive on these sort of things, and, and including infrastructure and transportation. And I, I do have to tell you that there is a the beginnings of a market change in the state in regards to how people address him. And he'll go, I mean, listen, he'll go on Fox News and he'll argue with these people and he'll talk in their language because he came from Indiana and he knows how to talk to them. And so I, I think that he has he has provided some things here and there. Um, my my biggest political quibbles, I think, would be everything that we're talking about just needs to be like ramped up by a hundred to two hundred times. Like it, like the the time is now is what I would say because the the unfortunately the radicalization that we're talking about it's so much worse than I think anybody really wants to admit at this point. Yeah, uh, well, to, to that point, I want to bring up um, towards the towards the end of your book, you identify. Um, four different categories of, of toxic masculinity. Um, and, and I wrote them down in case you didn't. didn't I'm so them. glad you did because <laughs> I, I remember them, but I don't remember the order. Yeah. Yeah. You said, you said number one was those who were just sort of ignorant of patriarchy, right? Those who have, have, who just have no sense, no sense that it exists have been so, so are so, um, you know, like the fish who can't, the, the fish who can't see water. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the, the second one were people like yourself and, and, and uh, pe people and people like me who who saw it around them, never felt right, took them some time to sort of uh, get get out or to or I don't know if we, we, you don't get out, as you said, but but at least to be able to, to, to do the work in a regular practice. Um, the third one, you said those who are just swayed by the allure of societal privilege. Right. They just they just like the privilege. And, and, and the fourth one, you said, are those who are actively trying to reinforce patriarchal privilege right so who who are really out there i guess those are the ones who would actually say hey hey we got to teach women their place again the sort of incel uh uh manosphere kind of people and i guess uh, but wait I, before you go what's the, the second category is people like how are, how are you a category of toxic masculinity Oh, just masculinity in general. Oh, so I, I, I was making the argument that there are four types of men. So there are men who have. All right, sorry, I thought it was four yeah. types of toxic masculinity. Okay. Keep, you can keep. I got it. No, no, no. <laughs> well, let's let Jared explain. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I would. I, so I would just say that, like, this is a really hard thing to talk about, right? Because each of these categories requires different things. You know what I mean? Like they all they they all require full measures, half measures, considerations, moving around. And 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 so I would say, on one hand, like over here, like the 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 most dangerous group of people would be proud misogynists, right? The ones who um they, I've been seeing this more and more lately, where people are like, uh, yeah, misogyny is right. Let's look at they they study the literature. You know what I mean? Like they will look at feminist writings and, and for the record, the feminist uh, perspective, it, and, and this has been so twisted and I know anybody watching this knows this, but feminism is not about the empowerment of women. It's about the dismantling of patriarchy. It's about bringing about an equitable society. It's about getting rid of these dangerous systems that have overtaken everything and have basically constructed uh, all of human history, right? Like trying to undo millennia's worth of damage. Well, there are people who read it and they're like, okay, here, here's what's going on. Here's how it works. Here's how we dismantle it. There are other people who read those and they're like, ah, there it is. That's how it works. Let's keep going. Let's, let's turn the heat up a little bit. Right. And so you see people, I mean, and it happens in these really overt ways. We have like misogynistic cults you know we have we have figures like a jordan peterson who's like teaching people oh it's jungian psychology and <laughs> and maleness we have venture capitalists I would we say. have venture capitalists who are engaged with them Woo! oh well that's a whole different ball game that that is i mean they want to go to mars and become king <laughs> is what they want. So you have like those groups of people. Then you have other people who, if you said the word patriarchy to them, 
they would probably walk around all day being like, what are we talking about here? And that's actually a really hard thing because when you study this stuff, you also know that there is personal privilege and there is societal privilege, right? So to like go in and tell like my family who has no money whatsoever, your privilege immediately, like you'll be lucky if they don't grab their shotgun and come out on their property, right? Because they've been taught, how dare you tell me I'm privileged? Because actually part of their part of their character, part of their identity is that they are working class, run down, exploited, right? They, they, they take pride in that, to be honest, right? But we do also have to talk about the societal part, which most people do not understand, because like you said, it's water. And they do not understand that they have been swimming in water. And not only that, but everything has told them that they're not in water. Everything is designed to make them think that they're not in water. Uh, politics, culture, all this stuff in this country particularly is tested and, and, and just absolutely directed at making sure that people do not question these systems of power and do not come to reckon with them. And so you have a lot of people who are working very hard. They do not have access to the books. My God, they can't afford college. I mean, that, and you go back to your question about how did I get away from this? I decided it was worth taking on tens of thousands of dollars worth of student debt. Yep. And I understand, by the way, why other people wouldn't do it. And then right? he became an elite liberal professor like me. There you go. And so I ended up getting the gig. And, and then, like, I understand why they would hate me. I understand why they would be mad at people who were able to go to college. And, and by the way, a lot of the conversation we're having right now, and this boils down to it, and we haven't said it yet, is how do people who went to college and how do people that didn't go to college talk to each other? And how do they come to some sort of an, uh, an, of an objective reality? And so much of what we're dealing with right now are people who are either ignorant of the circumstances willfully ignorant of the circumstances or totally aware. And what do they do? How do they interact? And it turns out shared society is really hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, you have, a, I mean, to the, to the, to the college thing and, and to the fact that, that we both, we both teach in, in universities, you have a, you have a quote I loved. It's the, it's the only one I wrote down in, in my notes for, for today. Uh, you, you, you said, millennials don't care much for binary anything. And, and I, I, I loved that because I, of course, see that in my own classroom all the time. And I'm sure you'll agree with me. I mean, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I assume you'll agree with me that this whole rhetoric about coddled college students is absurd because I've never seen braver people in the, my life than the people who are willing to stand up and go, excuse me, sir, you can't talk like that to me in my class. Right? That's not a fear of conflict. That's a willingness to engage in conflict. Um, but I, but I, I guess my question is, when we both acknowledge just how inspiring in some ways this next generation of young people is, are you are you optimistic? Absolutely, I am. And I, I'll say, by the way, real fast, like on that, like the ability to speak out and speak truth to power, it's not even about protecting themselves. They take care of each other. Yeah. Like they will not stand for one of their own being treated. You know, it, it's actually a really incredible thing. And it makes me think in my life, in the life of the lives of the people that I know and love, like how many of us have swallowed that stuff and just been like, oh my God, I, I, I you know, that was awful, but I can't imagine saying something. They have no problem with that. They, they, they are ready to go. They will risk their jobs, their livelihoods. I just, I was talking with a, a student who I want to say he's 21 years old. And he's like, my staff that I work with at a fast food restaurant, we are not being treated well. And I'm putting together a strike. And I was like, I was like, what are we talking about? But you're also talking about university students, though. I mean, right. and, and you know, we were raised going to Hebrew school where we were basically told like every day, Holocaust is coming, Holocaust is coming. <laughs> you know, so I love your optimism. We've had a few um, other guests on our show that have had this, shared the same optimism for the same reasons that you do. But history still tells us a different story. It absolutely does, because it, here's the sad truth of it, is that history is not actually won over by individuals. 
And this goes to the heart of exactly what we're talking about. Like if we want, if we want to have a conversation about great man of history rhetoric, that always leads to fascism every time, which is because somebody stands up and they're like, I can do anything I want because I'm called to history to do it. That's how you get fascism. That's how you get genocide. That's how you get all of this stuff. It's like, well, yeah, maybe I don't need voted for. I have history, right? The truth is that history uh, is most often changed and things are most often made better when people realize they can work together and when they engage in solidarity and they form movements. This country has a long history of that. These moments where it feels like nothing could possibly ever change. People are powerless. They are alone. And by the way, I say this all the time. And for anyone listening, I think this is always worth hearing. There are a lot of people who spend a lot of money and exert a lot of power to make you feel powerless and make you feel alone. And you are not. And to go back to the masculine ideal, the masculine ideal of the rugged individual tells him you cannot rely on other people. If you rely on other people, you are weak. And it is not an accident that uh, organized labor and work unions were done away on the basis of rugged individualism. It was done intentionally and systematically to make sure that people could be exploited even more than they already were. And this is an important thing, and this is one of the reasons why I'm hopeful. We're having this conversation about masculinity right now. People were not sitting around writing books, reading books, and constantly dissecting the idea of masculinity for all of these decades. It was natural. If you went around it, if you talked about gender being fluid, first of all, someone would say, what is gender, right? And, and, and I forget who said the quote, and it's important. Somebody, a uh, very prominent feminist, and I, I have it somewhere, said that when you start seeing the idea of gender troubled, you know that the system is in trouble because they want you to be in one place, right? They, they don't want you to feel the freedom to be able to move around. That blurring of lines, along with this uh, larger idea of solidarity and this idea that like, no, I do not have to put up with this and nobody should have to put up with this. Conversations like this. I'm incredibly encouraged. And by the way, like for anyone who follows my stuff, you will know I'm not a pie in the sky person. I, 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 I study fascism. I study far right, you know, extremist and terrorist. I know that we are at a crossroads. It could get really bad. It really, like, like some of the scariest, most cynical tweet, tweet threads I, I read. Listen, but in order to actually change things, you have to understand how bad things could get, <laughs> right? You need to understand like, oh, we can go this way, but you need to understand over here, the world is on fire, right? And, <laughs> Jack, and that's- I don't, know, I don't know if you know this, but I actually, I teach movement building for a living. That's what I do. <laughs> oh, good for you. <laughs> we need more of that. And I think- I think what is missing from this is, you know, individuality is, is great, particularly for expression and for deciding who you are and who you're going to be. It is this alienation and atomization of society is why we have reached this point of consequence. And I think watching that old idea of masculinity begin to get broken down and to change gives me more hope than almost anything. So I am I am hopeful, but it is it's a long road. Yeah. So I was about to I, I'm going to ask one snarky question. And I'll go, is part of your hopefulness because of your white male privilege? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I would say that part of my hopefulness is actually the fact that, like, I live in Georgia, right? Georgia has decided, uh, like it always does that it's going to crack down on voting. It's going to push disenfranchising uh, experts. I mean, uh, uh, you know, memes, right? And I keep telling people that, I'll tell you, they have been cracking down on voting for as long as there's been voting allowed to people of color. But I'll tell you who else has been working in the opposite direction. People of color who have been fighting for their right to vote and be represented. So like down here in Georgia, it's people like Stacey Abrams. It's it's the coalition that she leads down here. It makes me. And, and by the way, like there are more eyes than ever on this stuff. 
Like it used to be like this would show up in the New York Times on like page 15, if there, right? The fact that this is now out front, um, there's other stuff that I'm actually uh, hopeful about, but also cynical about. Like everybody wants to say, well, look what Coca-Cola is doing. They're saying this is wrong. And it's like, well, they're doing it for their corporate bottom line, right? <laughs> but the fact that they know that the future belongs to inclusivity and progressive ideas says that there's a direction that we can go. So, but I, and by the way, like, absolutely, white male privilege is at the heart of this and let's go out and start moving and make things better. But I, I do have hope and I see it in a lot of people. And, and quite frankly, over the past few years, watching America go in this direction and watching the students of mine who are uh, marginalized, who are vulnerable populations, watching them to come together and fight for their dignity and to fight for the things that should be theirs from birth. Um, it's one of the most inspiring things that I've seen. That's awesome. Well, for, uh, uh, first I want for everyone watching this, I just want to, I just want to identify that that is the correct way to respond to being accused of white male privilege, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Not defensive, not, I would like everybody to know that. Well, can I just say really quickly, one of the things, uh, just to go ahead and like put all this into perspective. Um, so I, you know, I, I also teach young white male students, right? Cisgender, uh, you know, uh, heterosexual students. And, you know, when Me Too was happening, when, you know, the, the country was changing after the election of Donald Trump, I would have some of them come in and they'd be like, it's a really frightening time to be a white male in America. And I was like, welcome to America. The whole point, and this goes back to the privilege thing, and 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 this is, and again, like, I'm not a guru, I'm not a saint. Like, I, I, I grew up, you know, in this white family who has its own problems with prejudices. I have to like put all of that into perspective. I have to think about who I am, how I perform, how I treat people, how I communicate with people. It is a work in progress. But I have to tell you, white men saying, oh my God, it feels like I can't just say whatever I'm thinking. It's like, that's what everybody does. That split second that fear has now created in their consciousness is what every other group of people has to have, which is, oh, I just had a thought. Should I just say it as it is just immediately? Or should I think about how will this affect other people? How will this affect the environment? How will this affect this team, this effort, this movement, this message? That second of consideration that has been won over in the past few years is the establishment of something that should have been there for forever. But that privilege, that moment of reckoning is something uh, white men have to deal with. And, and it's it's on us. Nobody can do it for us. Even though there are now societal pressures and fears or whatever, like you either make room for that and realize that's valid or you put on the armband and you go overthrow a capital. I, I think those are those are basically the choices at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, do you have any questions for us? Well, I just wanted to ask you, what you what did you learn writing this book? What what surprised you the most? Because I walked away from mine just feeling like I, everything that I'd ever known was completely false, which is a good feeling, I have to say. That's that's kind of nice. Yeah, I mean uh, that that's a very similar thing. You know, I, I entered it with one with one idea, thinking I was going to discover some sort of um, essential idea of what fatherhood is, and I discovered that there really was no no good argument for gendered parenting at all. I mean, it doesn't mean people of any gender shouldn't parent. Just just means there's not specific roles that go with 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 gender. It made me realize how many things in my own life I'm I'm inadvertently uh, reinforcing things that I hate. Right, that I didn't even, re you know, like my, I, I come from a background. I've always been uh, pretty liberal, pretty progressive, and I mean, I shouldn't say pretty, extremely liberal, extremely progressive, and yeah. always wanted freedom for everyone. And I started to see the ways where I lived into certain ideas about what it means to be a father that were hurting the last people in the world I would ever want to hurt, and I had to own up to that. Um, and uh, yes, that's painful a lot of the time, but in the end, it's very, very liberating. You know, I, I I kept having after my book came out, I kept getting these emails, um, a lot of them from from women who wanted to know how to raise their sons. And they were like, we're very I'm, I'm very worried about my son in this environment. I'm very worried about what there is for him and what. I'm just throwing a pillow at a cat who's making a lot of noise. <laughs> so that the cat's <laughs> hey, I'm shocked. that I'm shocked that mine hasn't busted in at this point. I'll be honest. Like, yeah. OK, keep going. 
Um, and, and I have to say that what gave me hope about that, because what you were saying about thinking about like how to raise and how to, to be a parent, it used to be a thing in a lot of ways where it was like, how, how do you even begin to raise a son, right? You just let the son go do whatever he needs to do, like, because he's an individual, right? And, right. and he should be allowed to make his own way. And, you know, if he gets in a fight and bust out some teeth, maybe we'll have to meet with the principal, but otherwise hands off, worry about your daughters, right? Teach them how to navigate. And I have to tell you that that, that new uh, scrutinization of it, that feels hopeful. That, that, that feels good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as mothers, we're like, well, if, if we can fix it in the current generation, at least this is the one area we know that we have some, perhaps, unless the social order is so much more powerful than our individual will, which is sometimes a fear. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Jared. I really appreciate you doing this. I hope that we get to the end of the pandemic and I can we can meet in person. And I, I promise you, if we meet in person, I'll give you a hug and talk about my feelings with no uh, with, with no insecurity about it. I love it. I love immediate intimacy. Let's do it. Let's make it a day. I got one more question for you. Yeah. Then we'll... So we're excited that you're uh, excited to get your feminist dad t-shirt, which even though you're not a father, you'll proudly wear that. When Jordan published an article on the difference between gender and sex on a science blog, he got a lot of hate comments, as I'm sure yeah. you're familiar with. And one of them called him a mangina. So we also have decided to make t-shirts that say mangina. Would you wear one of those? I absolutely would. I love, man, that alter. So like I'm currently doing a project right now, which is all about pseudoscience that like pushed racism and, you know, like, you know, sexual discrimination. And I have to tell you the stuff that they've come up with, with that, the low T explanation, the soy boy, the soy in the food is what's making this reckoning with masculinity happen. That's just, that's wonderful. Well done, everybody. We're glad to hear it. We're glad to hear it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. It was great meeting you. Great meeting you too.